Welcome back to our study called, I Will Surely Bless You. We're looking at the end of Genesis chapter 22. Today we're in 15 through 19. And uh, this study is called, By Myself I Have Sworn. All right, let's take a look at the first part, which we see is the covenant really restated here. Hopefully you have picked up the repetition of God declaring his covenant promises to Abraham. Starting in verse 17, we read, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sands on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Here again are the four promises of God. The first is that God will bless Abraham. God's reaffirming his covenant, uh, his, his covenant love, really, toward Abraham. It's not just a covenant, not just agreement. There's a... Uh, uh, the covenant of love. Remember we talked about uh, the Kessid. There's that mutual kindness, mutual love between God and Abraham that uh, was demonstrated between God and Abimelech. So, or between Abraham and Abimelech. Uh, now God has chosen here in this story to put his grace, his favor on Abraham and the decades that have passed and the missteps that Abraham has had have not changed that. Abraham is a blessed man. That's it. Case closed. God's done it. God blessed. Nothing can change that. Uh, the second thing, Abraham is reminded that his offspring will be as the stars of heaven and as the sands of the seashore. He will be a father of multitudes. His offspring will be innumerable. At this point in his life, Abraham is still having to take this by faith because uh, since Ishmael is out of the picture now, remember he kicked him out. Uh, Isaac is all he has left. He is the only child he has left now. The third promise is in verse 17, where Abraham is told that his offspring shall possess the gates of their enemies. This is really a restatement of what God has already promised Abraham when he told him to look around at the land of Canaan, and he said that it would all belong to his family. But the promise doesn't just stop with the physical land of Israel. Paul explains to us in Romans 4.13 that God's promise was, uh, was that Abraham and his offspring would be the heir of the whole world. It wasn't just going to be Canaan. It was going to be the entire world that they were going to get. <clears throat> so, uh, Paul also points out that all those that have faith in Christ are Abraham's offspring. And according to Jesus, his followers, the meek, would inherit the earth. And their enemies, even the gates of hell itself, would not prevail against them, according to Jesus in Matthew 6, 18. Truly, the offspring of Abraham will possess the gates of the enemy. The fourth promise is the reminder that Abraham is being blessed so that he will be a blessing to the nations. And that promise has been in a state of being fulfilled since then, really. I mean, you look at the... Uh, the nation of Israel has always been a blessing to those people that it's been around. God's people, God's, uh, God's followers have always been a blessing. The true followers, not the fake ones, the true followers of God have been a blessing. Now, there's been a lot of people that came along in the name of Christianity that were not a blessing. <clears throat> but I don't really think those were true followers of Christ. The true followers of Christ, those who were humble, meek, uh, lowly, those who were the knots, uh, those who were the nothings, uh, those are the ones that really were a blessing to the world. Well, let's look at the next section, and we see here that God swears. Now, this is kind of interesting. Uh, notice that this is the third time in this passage that God speaks to Abraham. He tells him to take Isaac and sacrifice. Then we're told the angel of the Lord speaks to Abraham, telling him not to kill Isaac. And then the messenger of the Lord speaks again in this section we're looking at today. The promises we have heard from God uh, before, and that's what we've heard. We've already heard this promise. But we haven't heard it, uh, heard him say, by myself I have sworn. <clears throat> to understand what's going on here, all I have to do is turn to Hebrews 6 to read the commentary on this, on this passage. First, God swears by himself to show the certainty of his promises. Hebrews uses words like, uh, well, uh, what does it say? It says, <laughs> it says final for confirmation. Um, 
It says more convincingly. It says things like unchangeable character or guaranteed and a sure, steadfast anchor. I think we get the point here. And they're, they're words that are meant to show that God's not fooling around. God swears by himself to build up Abraham's faith. Um, now, you had, the, uh, you had the faith. He had the faith enough to believe that Isaac could be raised from the dead. Abraham uh, believes all the promises. He doesn't doubt any of the promises. Hebrews 6.15 says, And this Abraham, having uh, patiently waited, obtained the promise. By all these things, God worked faith in the heart of Abraham. The author of Hebrews explains that when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Since no one or no thing is greater than God, he cannot swear by anything other than himself. This is contrasted by human oaths, where people swear by something greater than them to prove their sincerity. Jesus mentions swearing by the altar and swearing by heaven in Matthew uh, chapter 23. Why do people swear oaths like this? Because they deceive, they lie, they fail. They can't always come through with their promises. They have character flaws. And an oath between people is meant to overcome those issues. But God's character is perfect. And he never lies, so why does he swear? Well, Hebrews says, to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose. It's Hebrews 6.17. See, the problem is our problem. Abraham's problem, not God's. Abraham and we need to be reassured, not because of God's flaws, but ours. He didn't need to swear because we have, because uh, he has sin and flaws. We needed the oath. We needed it because we have sin and flaws, not because God does. We need the sure and steadfast anchor of our souls, or we may drift into danger. John James says, and what, uh, what shall preserve us from drifting on the shore and being stranded there? The anchor. Drop down your anchor, believer. You need it. I repeat, even more than in, this, in the storm, raging on the, on the broad ocean. Why are Christians so worldly? What have the scenes and circumstances of earth so powerful and influence over us? Why? Just because our desires and expectations of the eternal realities and infant possessions of heaven are so little, they're so little thought of and so little cherished. Were the mind kept in contemplation of these realities and the soul more frequently revealed with foretastes of the heavenly food and feast could not be content to feed on the ashes and husks of this world. Now I want to go on to the next section. And we see another phrase here. It says, because you have obeyed. Because you have obeyed. One last thing here in this section. God says, because you have done this, I will surely bless you because you have obeyed my voice. He's talking about the sacrifice of Isaac. But wait, hadn't God already promised all these things to Abraham based on God's grace alone, right? <clears throat> The promise came decades before this obedience here. How can the promise be God's grace and Abraham's obedience at the same time? Matthew Henry said, God is pleased to make mention of Abraham's obedience as the consideration of the covenant. Not that this was proportionally proportionable consideration, but God graciously, graciously put this honor upon that by which Abraham had honored him. In other words, Abraham's obedience did not equal the blessing. His faith and obedience to God did not earn his salvation and blessing any more than ourselves. Abraham's faith and obedience are not equal to God's blessings. The blessings of God are not a wage paid for obedience. God owed Abraham nothing but graciously chose to include what Abraham did into the covenant. We think that our obedience deserves God's blessing or he blesses us because we've obeyed, then we have a cheap view of God's blessings. No God, no, 
God didn't promise to, uh, uh, you know, an equal, you do good, I'll bless. You do bad, I won't bless. You, they're, they're, you don't really see that too much in there. Now, there are, uh, there is that idea in there, but it's not always there. It doesn't always, it's not a one for one. Like, it's not, you know, the blessings don't equal the good thing you've done. So, uh, no, God promised and planned to honor obedience because God is gracious. He didn't have to honor obedience, right? Like, he was required to. He just did it. That's what he wanted to do. So, our obedience is not a payment or a wage owed. That's what we, what the, the wage that we're owed is death because we've sinned. Blessings and mercy and grace are not a debt owed. It's, it's something that God puts on us because he loves us. So, that kind of really wraps up that section. Let's, uh, let's finish there and we'll pick up next time. We'll look at uh, verses 20 through 24. And we'll look at the, the idea of providence and provision. We're going to be talking a lot about providence in these stories coming up here. But it really starts, really actually at the beginning, uh, it's throughout the entire Bible. We can't really get away from it. So, But we'll focus in on Abraham and his experience with the providence and provision of God.